Kunal, thanks so much for joining us here uh, on this very special uh, panel here in Dubai. So let me start by uh, talking to you about where things currently stand as far as Snapdeal is concerned in the overall context of the opportunities as well as the challenges sure. that you see in the market. Yeah, I think, uh, firstly, thanks for having me here. And um, it's always a pleasure um, speaking with you, Shireen, and being on, uh, be, being on the same panel as you. I think, uh, look, we've gone through a very long and interesting journey with, with, our, with our business, and at least we've demonstrated a lot of resilience through this process. Uh, it's a very, very large space, e-commerce in India, but it's also very clear that it's incredibly competitive. And each company that operates in that space, they have to decide, do they want to be in a perpetual loss-making mm. zone? or do they want to identify a kernel in their business and then build around that and be very focused on it and have excellence in that. And that should then lead to profitability, which is obviously the theme everyone's talking about right now. That's exactly what we've done. We focused on the value segment of the market and you know, built a lot of capabilities around that, whether it's private labels, whether it's tuning the logistics the right way, being ruthless about uh, variable costs, because if you have to deliver great quality, at low prices to consumers, we have to make sure that we are cutting out all the wastage in the system. Uh, so overall, we are quite happy with where we are at. Um, we feel that we are, build we are on our way to building a very lasting, enduring business. The fact that we've been around for uh, more than a decade and so many companies have come and gone shows that there is fundamental strength in the business, in the brand, and what it does for its customers. Our, um, also our business, we have a software business which you know, is obviously never as exciting to talk about as a B2C e-commerce business, which is Unicommerce, and it's a leading um, logistics tech SaaS pl platform, which 70% you know, of India's digital native and digital migrant brands uh, run uh, on Unicommerce, their entire supply chain, so it's essentially their operating system. That business is profitable for the last four or five years and growing 40-50% uh, you know, a year. So within our own company, we've seen uh, two different examples of how two different businesses were built in two different spaces. Um, but, but we are happy with where we are at, and the future looks uh, quite, quite optimistic. You know, it's interesting uh, that we've, we've been in a culture uh, where we've celebrated and paid a lot more attention to the loss-making businesses than we have to the profit-making businesses. You said that, you know, that business is not sexy, so to speak, but it is the one that's actually making money. So I, I want to address this issue of perpetual losses. And do you think that you would have been able to identify this kernel of uh, creating enduring value and finding value? Value, had it not been for the adverse times that you went through? Because you know you did have a couple of near-death experiences. You are here now to tell the tale. But if it hadn't been that, uh, would you have moved away from this perpetual loss model that a lot of the ecosystem is walking down? You know, our greatest powers come from our greatest wounds. So and it's actually, uh, it's not about, you know, in life, uh, Happiness is not about, not about not falling. It's about you know, sort of getting up every time you fall. I don't think any founder's journey is straight line. There are so many great founders in the room here. I don't think anyone's journey is uh, a straight line journey. That said, um, you know, some, the, 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 the twisted part or the entangled part of some journeys get highlighted more than others, and ours did. Uh, but that's OK. I think we, you learn from it. There are some lessons in all of these uh, twists and turns. But also, this is what makes organizations and cultures resilient um, to various types of storms. And also, you realize as a founder that it's really at the, when you're at the bottom of the abyss, when you have to muster up that little bit of courage to continue. And it's at that bottom of the abyss when you feel no advice can help you, nobody you can go to will give you any kind of uh, you know, positive words of encouragement that will work. But all you need to do is just have that little bit of extra courage, and you do come out of that phase. Uh, but it has all those, uh, you know, evolutions and and um, uh, you know challenges have made us obviously wiser to build the businesses we are building now, yeah. and also support the next generation of founders to uh, to maybe not make the same mistakes that the prior generation has made. 
and that's uh, that's something that I do want to talk to you about because uh, uh, you know I know that you're enjoying your role now as as an investor and you've got a plethora of companies in your portfolio, many of which are actually profitable uh, uh, today amongst the few that are profitable today. But you know, Kunal, uh, if you if you were to look at the playbook, uh, and now you you know you said very clearly that you're here to build a business that's resilient. You're here to build a business that's sustainable and profitable for the long term. What is different from this playbook, uh, from the original playbook that you started with? Look, um, um, fundraising will give you pleasure, but profitability will give you happiness. Uh, and I think that's the, a big learning all founders are realizing. It gives you temporary pleasure. You see your name in the newspaper and, and all that, but then you realize that it's back to work. You still have to build a profitable business. I think there is a lot of talk about um, um, you know, that suddenly everyone wants to be profitable. Actually, that's not necessarily true. I've rarely met founders who didn't know that they had to build a profitable business. It's just that they didn't know um, how much money and how much time it would take. So everyone was obviously kicking the can down the street, but it's not that awareness was missing. It was absolutely, absolutely there. Uh, but but now I think the, we are we are seeing companies take hard measures to actually get there faster, and the next generation of founders are constructing their businesses, constructing the P&Ls of their businesses, the cost structures of their businesses, keeping in mind that they, there is no longer and we are no longer in an era where it's okay to be profitable after five six years and keep raising money and keep losing money in the in the interim. People are still uh, you know burning nine rupees to earn a single rupee on an average. How do you then explain that? Well, I don't have to explain it because I'm not doing it. Uh, <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> but 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 I look, I think these are probably still, I don't think it's as pervasive uh, as it used to be. Uh, a lot of, there's a lot of sensitivity, sensibility and sensitivity around profitability and particularly unit economics. Uh, but look, it's also important for companies to realize that it's okay to change track. India has so much potential going forward. Um, and I feel the most important thing for founders is to keep their head in the game. We've kept our head in the game for 16 years, despite all the twists and turns, regulations, funding. And not my first funding winter, I can tell you. I see this, I think, my last count, third or fourth funding winter I've seen. And, um, you know, it's so important that founders appreciate the value of staying in the game because this funding winter will turn into a funding party again. You want to make sure you're, biz you're alive. It's so important just to, be, just to be alive and do whatever it takes to be alive from now until then, when resources become abundant again. Then also focus very, very ruthlessly on cutting out all the variable costs which are wasteful in the business, and then focus on growing the islands of profitability in the business. That's what we did like surgically removing malignant tumors. I guess those are the decisions that as founders you will need to take as you go about uh, trying to ride out the, the, the rough times and this funding winter. But you know, you talked about uh, the headroom for growth and the opportunities that you see here in India. And I think uh, while we can uh, argue about the depth of the Indian startup ecosystem. I think there is no argument about the breadth of the Indian startup ecosystem today. I mean, all kinds of problems are being addressed uh, at this point in time. Uh, so what excites you about the opportunities that India presents today in the spaces that you focus on? What is looking most exciting to you? What's the bull case? Uh, I think the base case of India is a bull case, right? Uh, I don't think, I don't think there is any case for India today which is not a bull case. Um, so I'm, I'm so excited about, um, you know, what the future holds for our country. You look at our GDP, right? Like uh, from, for 1700 years, from AD 1 to AD 1700, we were a top two economy. Now after 350 years, this present generation of Indians are going to see us become the third largest again, after 350 years. So we really live in, special uh, times, we added 3 trillion of GDP in 31 years. We're going to add 3 trillion more in the next seven, right? India had, since independence, we, re, we got 1 trillion of FDI into our country. Half of it came in the last eight years. 
all trends are pointing to only one direction, that the market size of India is just exploding as we speak. We're adding one of the few countries that's adding four or $500 billion of uh, GDP a year uh, right now. And so at least from, uh, from my perspective, it is a very exciting time, but there's also uh, important, important to mention the role the government has played, where they're obviously, you know, startup became a household name in India because the prime minister started talking about it so openly from 2014. Um, we also see wide-scale digitization. India is probably one of the most digitized countries in the, in the world right now. Uh, where everything, health stack and uh, identity stack, payment stack, everything is digitized. Um, domestic capital has gotten activated in the startup ecosystem through IPOs as well as, uh, uh, you know, earlier stage investments. And most importantly, Shireen, the, the best and the brightest uh, students and, and young folk in our country leaving the top colleges don't want to sit for, uh, you know, U.S. tech company job interviews anymore. They are... Uh, it's not that they want to start companies after they graduate. They have actually already started companies when they are in college now. So the age of entrepreneurship, the excitement around entrepreneurship, the galvanization that we are seeing in our ecosystem, I have never seen before. And I think it's just still, we are seeing the tip of the iceberg. You talked about uh, unlocking domestic pools of capital uh, and capital in general. And let's talk about the IPO market. You know, you were heading down that road. You've decided to take a detour for a while, uh, like many others at this point in time, reevaluating their plans uh, given the market condition. But, you know, for many uh, founders sitting in this room who are possibly exploring the possibility of an IPO a few years down the line or perhaps earlier, I'm not sure. Uh, how are you looking at it? Do you see it as a financing event, what do you see it as? It's a, it's a coming of age event. Uh, I think it's a growing up event. But, but look, I think a, a lot has been said to say the least about uh, tech IPOs in India. I do feel that uh, we, we, are, we are seemingly, like on the way up, we were conflating value with valuation, where you know, we were celebrating valuations where maybe not enough value had been built. I think we are again conflating value and valuations on the way down, where valuations have obviously fallen, but maybe the value in the business, val the value of those businesses and the value in those businesses actually increased in the time period, because they've all grown, they're impacting more people, they have more customers, they have more partners, uh, and they're creating more impact. So I I do feel though that um, India will be a great market from a public market standpoint, from an IPO standpoint for relatively modest size revenue companies, but which are profit making and have very predictable growth. From my experience of having gone through some of this process in the past, uh, Indian markets really, really would um, reward predictable, profitable companies, even if they are not humongous in size. And they can grow in the public markets. The Microsofts and the Apples, uh, they actually went public very early in their journeys and obviously our runaway successes over decades. So why can't we create such businesses in India? Why do we need to wait till companies become multi-billion dollars in valuation and then list them? There's no reason to. We can go earlier. Now that, that means there are some decisions founders have to make which are very structural in nature, which is raise less capital, uh, not go for you know, growth at any cost, and, and have the mindset of having the right frameworks in place that they can go list maybe year five or seven of their existence, not year 15 of their existence. One of the dilemmas that uh, uh, startup founders faced uh, and continue to face today is how much do you dilute and when do you dilute? And perhaps we have seen too much dilution uh, across Indian startups because money does come with its own set of obligations as well. Um, but I, I think it's a function of the market, uh, Shireen, where in the early days when we were building, when we were an early stage startup, the market was not very deep and we almost had to raise capital to spend it in market creation. And obviously each financing round led to dilution. I think founders now have an opportunity to not go through that level of dilution where they can market is a lot deeper and it is getting deeper. So you don't need to raise that much capital to activate the market for your business. But the market is already there, it's already activated. But sometimes the desire to grow faster 
than natural paces of growth gets founders to raise more money, spend more money. And look, companies like ours and others have done it in the past. But in hindsight, I wouldn't know how, how would we have done it any differently because that was the need of the R at that point in time and only way out. But I think there is another way out now, another way to build businesses, which is building them patiently with less capital, less dilution, um, and with an aim to take them public earlier in the, in the company's journey. You know, you talked about uh, building businesses patiently. And again, I, I want to understand from you whether you believe that we've, we've uh, perhaps we're now starting to see a correction again, but you know, the last few years, uh, this need to say that we've built a business or we've made a unicorn or so on and so forth in like six months, 12 months and so on and so forth. Uh, the, the patience required to actually build out a business or we've gotten sucked into this illusion that building a business is, uh, you know, is a 12 month event when it's actually not. So culturally, you think that there needs to be a reset? Or is that a concern that you have? You know, I, I, I generally have a different ph philosophy. I, I feel you first start with the necessary. Right, then you move to what's possible, and soon you'll find yourself doing the impossible. So I think we straight went for the impossible to begin with as an ecosystem, but I feel maybe going back to the basics and starting with the necessary, which is having a clear understanding of why we are building, what we are building, what the margin structures of those business are, what, what kind of cost structure that that margin can actually support versus having bloated cost structures which the margins of a business like that can never ever pay for. Um, and then, you know, you graduate to higher levels of complexity and ambition. Uh, but we've, as an ecosystem, gone the other way around. We've started with the impossible, then maybe the we'll go to the possible, and now we are doing the necessary, which is... Asking the question about <laughs> yeah. how, where, what, uh, and, and that's the process that's currently underway. But, uh, you know, uh, between the excitement and uh, the sort of challenges and the opportunities that you see, Kunal, uh, are, there, are there spaces that are nascent at this point in time that, you know, if, yeah. you, were to, if you were to take a future bet on, yeah. uh, what would those be? We need sectors that can employ hundreds of millions of people because we have so many uh, people in our country. So there's agriculture, there is retail, there's manufacturing. So digitizing, digi digitization of the manufacturing supply chain is a very, very important theme in our country. And, uh, you know, India's GDP contribution from manufacturing is going to go from 15% to 21% in the next seven years of a doubling base of GDP. So how much new manufacturing GDP is getting created is, is quite incredible. The second is SaaS, right? Um, already we've hit, you know, India's software exports 150, 200 billion. Why can't we have product, software product exports and not just services exports? We are at 10, 12 billion dollars of ARR of software being exported from India, which is SaaS. And most reports would say this will become 35 billion and account for up to 8% of India's, uh, of, of global SaaS in the next four, five years. The third, I would say, is healthcare. Uh, you know, recently I had a health scare and I realized that you have to wait very long, even in top private hospitals, even if you know the doctor. And all of us have experienced that. Imagine if you live in a small village or a small town, how painful it would be. Our population will peak in 2040. We will just never be able to build enough hospitals for them. So we will need a lot of investment in technology and preventive healthcare. Uh, and finally, fintech. I know a lot has been said about fintech, regulations, etc. But this is the era of what I call the boring fintechs, that there is so much digitized infrastructure created, so much connectivity created, and a lot of companies which are solving very rudimentary fintech problems, uh, which I feel will uh, chart the future of that industry, versus companies only looking for regulatory air pockets to have some sort of near-term arbitrage. How do you see the global story and the startup ecosystem's linkage to that global story. Do you see outside of SaaS that, that happening in the next few years? Yeah, I think we are seeing a lot of, uh, uh, SaaS is often spoken about, cross-border SaaS, so I won't say more about that, although that also is a very exciting theme. The point is, if we can sell $150, $200 billion of software services, why can't we sell software products, right, um, of an equal or larger magnitude? But there is obviously a big theme around manufacturing exports. We are seeing companies in surgical equipments who are doing exports, agri, um, and various other sectors 
where India has already been a big exporter, but in this era of what they call China plus one, although I say it, we are the one, not just China plus one, uh, we, I feel that there is a huge opportunity around for manufacturers in India to truly go global. As a founder, and it's, you know, when once you hit the headlines and everyone's saying nice things about you and your company, all is good. But during the tough times when you're being tested uh, and there's no headlines chasing you, or at least the wrong kind of headlines then chasing you, it's a lonely, it's a lonely space. Yeah, it's a lonely corner office, uh, and you've you've had to experience that yourself. I know you said that you have to find the courage to say, "I'm going to, I'm going to keep going." But to be, you know, what has been the mechanism? You know, who do you talk to? Who do you reach out to? Do you seek help? Do you have, you know, do you create a support system? I mean, what has been the mechanism for you? Do you own your vulnerability? Do you acknowledge your vulnerability? How has it worked for you? Yeah, I would, I would actually give 100% of the credit to my partner and co-founder Rohit, because, you know, we have such um, incredible, unquestioning trust and mutual respect that. Nobody is superhuman, right? Like everyone has, people will come to me, oh Kunal, you guys are so resilient. Like you haven't seen my low days, right? We all have our low days. Thankfully, when it's been my low day, it's been Rohit's high day and vice versa. And what it ensures is that as a unit, you keep moving forward. You don't let your own insecurities, your own vulnerabilities at that moment get the best of you and discourage you from having that courage to continue. And, um, you know, I, by the way, also not all storms come to cause a disruption. Some of them actually come to clear your way also. Mm. And, and I've seen that over and over again. And at the end of the storm, you find the strength um, uh, that comes from having dealt with it. So at some level, having a very trusting, uh, uh, mutually respectful relationship in the form of a co-founder is so critical in this journey. I wouldn't know, like I would, there's no way I would be on this stage today if it weren't for uh, Rohit's partnership with me. Thank you very much, uh, Kunal, for sharing your learnings, your insights, uh, your bull case for India as well as for India startups. Uh, thanks very much. It's always a pleasure speaking with you. Ladies and gentlemen, big round of applause for Kunal. Thank you. Thanks, Shri.